It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Hi everyone, my name is Nicholas Gonzalez and I'm the associate pastor here at St. Andrew. And on behalf of our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Mark Rico, I want to welcome you to our word, Sunday Word and Song, which includes our message from this past Sunday service, as well as a contemporary song from our contemporary praise service. If you'd like to learn more about the ministry of St. Andrew, head on over to our website, mystandrew.org, where you can learn more about our in-person services that happen at 8, 9.30 and 11 on Sunday mornings or 7 p.m. on Monday night, as well as online Bible studies and all the other ministries that happen by God's grace through all of you. We give thanks for all of you and we pray a wonderful blessing on your service today. Turn to uh, the word of the Lord uh, for this Sunday morning and it comes to us from the gospel according to Luke, the fourth chapter beginning at the 21st verse and is read for us today by Moses Ammons. Then he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, doubtless you will quote me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there's many, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah. When the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine all over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to the widow at Zephyrath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Grace, mercy, and peace to you in the name of Jesus, the light of the world. Amen. So something that I have shared with all of you before is that I am not really the biggest reader. Uh, I'm working on becoming a better reader and just reading more consistently, but I'm honestly, I'm more into podcasts, and so people have told me about audiobooks, and I may work into those too, but uh, reading is just something that, you know, seemingly comes around every year with New Year's resolutions, and, you know, you can see how that habit's kind of going, but I'm working on it. I'm getting there. Now, I have a question for all of you because a lot of you have reached out and told me that you like to read and sent, wanted to send me book lists and things like that. So my question is this. Have you ever picked up a book and tried reading it from the middle? My guess is, based on some of the laughter in the air, the answer is probably no. And I would say that's a good thing. And just so we're clear, that is not how I read either. It's not that I'm trying to finish books early, okay? Okay. But I think if you tried that, right, if you tried to pick up a book and just read it from the middle on, you'd probably miss out on a lot of the context and, and the story about what's going on. I mean, maybe, you know, if you read the back cover, you'd get one or two characters' names, but you wouldn't get the full, complete story, right? And so uh, the reason I bring that up this morning is because if you weren't with us last week, and I know some people definitely weren't, then you would feel like this morning's gospel reading was just like picking up a book and reading it right from the middle. And here's the thing, on the one hand, you could probably get away with that in this text. Uh, there's kind of a full story there to a certain extent, but you would definitely be missing out on some key information and some details that go along with the rest of our gospel reading. In fact, if you started the gospel with us last week in Luke chapter 4, verse 16, the whole story, that's how it's told to us in Scripture. Not two broken parts, but one complete story. So it's important then for me this morning to kind of give you a brief recap of what happened last week, of where we started, how we got to this place. So, Luke 4, verse 16, the public ministry of Jesus begins, and in no other place than his hometown. Jesus is in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth, and it's on the day of the Sabbath. 
So this would have been a routine thing that Jesus had done, probably, probably for almost 30 years at that point, right? Because we say that Jesus' public ministry began when he was 30. So going to this synagogue in his home city would have been something that he did. So when he walked in, you know, he probably would have greeted the people the same way they would have greeted him, right? This was his hometown place. And after all the pleasantries and things are shared, everyone sits down and then Jesus is handed a scroll and he reads this scroll. Now, uh, what was on this scroll was some really special information. See, it was a prophecy, a reading from the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah is someone that the teachers, all the rabbis gathered there, they would have wanted to hear what he had to say because, well, they believe he prophesied to their ancestors, right? And so now hearing Isaiah again, he's speaking to them. This time through, of course, Jesus who is speaking. And when Jesus reads this scroll, the people are just in amazement as he speaks to them. And once he's done, he rolls it back up, he closes it, he puts it away, and he sits back down. And the people are kind of waiting on, on bated breath, what's going to happen next? Right? And Jesus looks at them and he says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And that's where our story for this morning picks up. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This would have been incredible news for the people there. I mean, it makes sense that they were marveling at Jesus when he says these words because they may have not realized it, but this was such a special moment. This was the first time that they'd heard this prophecy fulfilled. See, uh, the prophecy was all about this anointed one. Isaiah told the, the people of Israel about an anointed one who was going to come. Well, in Hebrew, the anointed one for the people of Israel would have been the deliverer, the person who would deliver them from out of their captivity, out of their sinfulness. All of this wonderful deliverance was what they expected from that anointed one. Now, if you look at what the anointed one means in Greek, well, the word that we often come up with is Messiah or Christos. So Isaiah is prophesying to the people of Israel about this anointed one who is Jesus. So when Jesus comes before the people to fulfill this prophecy, he's bringing them incredible news. He's telling them this. This is what the prophecy said. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. All of these wonderful things Jesus is proclaiming to this people, and it's fulfilled in their hearing. He is the anointed one, just as he says to them, that this prophecy is now fulfilled right here for you. And I really want to kind of hone in on that last sentence because the proclamation of the year of the Lord's favor was something those people had been waiting for and waiting for and waiting for, that their ancestors were waiting for, generation upon generation of people passing and waiting for the year of the Lord's favor, or as we heard it called last week, the year of Jubilee. And what happens during the year of Jubilee is that all debts are forgiven, not repaid, forgiven. All prisoners are set free. All land is returned to its owner. There is wild, incredible celebration for all the people. It is full-on jubilee. This was something that the people had waited for so long to hear this prophecy fulfilled, to be there for the moment when it happened. And right now, here in their hearing, it's fulfilled. I mean, what a moment. And yet, as we all know, they don't celebrate the Jubilee. But nonetheless, I mean, could you imagine what it would have been like to be there? To hear Jesus tying all their ancestry together and to say right here and right now, this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. Back in the city of Nazareth, the Messiah, the Anointed One, proclaiming this is fulfilled. The captives are set free. The people will rejoice. The oppressed are no longer oppressed. The sight, the blind have their sight. The year of the Lord's favor right here, right now for you. I mean, their lives were being changed right before their very eyes. But you wouldn't know based on how they react. 
See, because when all the, the marvel of what Jesus has said begins to wear off, when all that amazement kind of just dissipates so quickly, they begin to whisper and say to one another, and, and they ask this question. It starts spreading around the room. Isn't this Joseph's son? And I think on the one hand, you can kind of hear this with a positive spin and say, oh, isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this great? I mean, Joseph's son from Nazareth, he's telling us this prophecy is fulfilled. How awesome. But if you read between the lines, and in fact, if you listen to what Jesus says, you know that's not the case. That when they ask this question, they have some other thoughts in their hearts and in their minds. It's in fact why Jesus addresses them the way he does. When they're asking, is this not Joseph's son? Jesus says to them, doubtless you will quote me this proverb then. Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do here also in your hometown the things we have heard you've done at Capernaum. See, as is often the case with Jesus, he knows more about what's going on in the people's hearts and minds than they're often willing to reveal. Even though the prophecy that they had been waiting, that all their ancestors for generation upon generation had been waiting for was fulfilled, proclaimed right then and there, they'd already moved on. You see, uh, Jesus even highlights another city because he knows that what they're really asking for is for him to do more. Hey, Jesus, you did all this wonderful stuff for those people for Capernaum, this other place, so what are you going to do for us? We're your hometown people. You're back where uh, you grew up, where you were born, right? I mean, so if you did those wonderful things for them, what are you going to do for us? We go way back. We've got that hometown connection, right? Going back to the manger, going back to Abraham, so if you did that for them, we can't wait to see what you're going to do for us. And I mean, when I hear this, when I think about that thought process, man, I mean, how arrogant do you have to be to miss it? I mean, how prideful do you have to be to miss what's going on right before your eyes? To think that these people just heard this proclamation fulfilled for the first time ever, and they've already moved on from it. This, this sound of Jesus proclaiming such good news. And they're already past it. I mean, uh, the captives being set free. Things that they had never really seen before. And yet, they're, they're on from it, right? I mean, essentially what they're saying to themselves now is in really what they're thinking. What they're saying to Jesus is, yeah, so you did that for them. But what are you going to do for us? You know, as, as I reflected on this passage... I'd be lying to you if, you said, if I said I didn't wrestle with that similar feeling, uh, with that same sense of pride in myself. And here's the thing, I mean, I don't got a hometown connection with Jesus. I grew up in Jersey, right? I mean, depending on your perspective, that's like Nineveh, you know? And yet, I can't even count up the amount of times that I've thought just like these people here. That I've heard the words of Jesus proclaimed to me, that good news. And I've thought then, well, what about me? I've seen the work of Jesus in the lives of people around me. I've told others about that work. And then I thought, well, if Jesus can do that for them, imagine what he can do for me. And what, what's so messed up, what's so lost in that thought process is that I'm having a hard time coming to grips with the fact of what Jesus has already done for me. That just like those people, we move on from it so quickly. I start to think about, well, with that pride and my sinfulness inside of me, I'm so worried about myself that I'm missing what Jesus is doing right in front of me. My pride just serves kind of as a distraction pulling me away from the work of Jesus, as if perhaps he's not done enough yet. I want more. I'm too busy thinking about myself and it's kind of just like being one of those people in the synagogue there. Distracted by the fact that, well, I think that I'm better, that I've got a, a special connection to him. And maybe you haven't wrestled in that same way, but my guess is you've had some of those thoughts and feelings too. Uh, your pride has gotten in the way and, and blinded you and distracted you Thinking that, well, I'm more special or I deserve more. Jesus is going to do more for me. And none of us like admitting that. And certainly none of us like hearing about it. We're kind of just like those people in the synagogue. 
It's because after Jesus addresses them, when, when he tells them what they're doing, they don't want to hear it. And so we hear they're filled with rage. So much rage, in fact, that they want to send him off a cliff. That they chase him out of the synagogue to the city's limits to get rid of him. So sure, maybe we don't push Jesus off a cliff, but instead we just let our justification of our pride keep distracting us, keep blinding us from what Jesus is doing, what he's already done for us, and how that matters. We just move on in just such a brief moment after hearing such good news. But the beauty of this the beauty of the fact that even when we move on so quickly is that Jesus' words are still true. That they never become undone by our own actions because it's Jesus who's done all the work. It's Jesus who works even when we have turned away. Even when we forget the good news, Jesus is still working in the midst of our forgetfulness. His spirit works to draw us back to the place where he did everything for us. The Spirit works to draw us right back to the cross. Because on that cross, right, is where Jesus died for you. It's where Jesus died for me, where all of our sin, all of our shame, our pride, our selfishness, it all went to die with him for you. This is good news this is news that we don't just move on from. And this is the news that Jesus proclaims to us. That in our hearing, as we listen, this is true. Today, scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all we have to do is receive it. Uh, to sit and to listen as Jesus speaks over us. That when, when Jesus says he has set the captives free, we see that we are free from the chains of sin. That when Jesus says the blind have been given sight, we no longer walk in darkness, but we have seen the light of the world. When Jesus says the oppressed go free, we know that the devil no longer can hold us because Jesus is the one holding us now. When Jesus says he's proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor, he means it right here and right now. It's the sound of Jubilee. And the sound of Jubilee can be something as simple as Jesus saying to you, I forgive you. It can be something as simple as Jesus saying to you, just like he did on that night so long ago, this is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. The sound of Jubilee looks like the little moments in our daily lives when relationships are reconciled, when brothers and sisters in Christ say to one another, the peace of Christ be with you, when our voices are raised as Jesus rains down his promises on us each and every day. The sound of Jubilee is the voice of Jesus speaking over us, moving within us, and saying to us at every moment, I love you, and you are mine. Church, my hope and prayer for you is that whether you've been here perhaps for the first time today or the hundredth time, that the words of Jesus continue to bring you joy. That those words remind you that you have been set free because of his great love for you. That wherever you go, your eyes and ears are open to the sound of jubilee. Because that's what a life in Jesus does for me and for you, now and forever. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
As we close today, I invite you to join me in the prayer that our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.